Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Uh, welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Uh, we have a special guest with us today, um, uh, Kevin Anderson, but we're going to come back to that because as we normally do, we start with, hey, Joel, what have, what have you been up to? Yeah. First of all, let me, are those Two Dumbass merchandise glasses that you no, got on there? No, just, no, they're not. In fact, we're going to get Maybe that's them. a new, uh, <laughs> new item to be wearing. Huh? <laughs> But uh, what have I been up to? Uh, you know, we just did a podcast earlier, so I burned a couple things on that. But uh, this last weekend, had the two grandkids up for the first time this winter and uh, got them outside and sleep over at the cabin and went sledding and we took them down in the woods. And it's kind of a funny story. We, we only have an ATV and the snow is, is pretty crunchy, tough walking, especially if you're just a three and a seven year old. So we hooked up the ATV to a, we've got like a Rubbermaid pull behind wagon. And uh, <laughs> they, they looked at us like, what are we going to set in? I'm like, get in the wagon. <laughs> <laughs> so we're bouncing. I didn't go very fast, but uh, they kind of enjoyed it. And uh, we went down and we're focusing on teaching them, you know, deer prints and footprints in the snow. That's right. Awesome. So. Of course, it's not deer prints to them. It's reindeer prints, reindeer, reindeer prints. <laughs> Don't want to tell them that their grandma is shooting these reindeer. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's what uh, that's our big uh, weekend was. So it's taken us a day, day and a half to recover from that. And you'll be there someday. So I, I would say Sammy had a very successful reindeer season. Actually. She had a really good reindeer. Santa is not happy with uh, my wife <laughs> this uh, this Christmas. Yeah, she uh, she filled some tags. Thank goodness, because I didn't fill any. But, you know, uh, uh, um, as you said, we did a podcast. I mean, the the thing where I guess I'm at right now is we are in the process of um, doing surveys of what what the deer herd looks like what what's made it through from a deer season perspective and it's i mean it's more just to feed feed me for excitement for next year so i'm uh i'm pretty excited about that we've got a couple of nice nice deer that i have not seen that uh, have popped up um what else you know, another thing we've been doing, JJ, and I know you guys have tried it. Uh, we're not going to go into great detail today, but uh, we've been uh, canning our venison this year versus freezing. And uh, if if you've not done that, uh, that's the only way to go, I think. Uh, have you ever had that? I've had it before, and I've been watching some uh, videos, and I've not done it, but I'm, I'm excited. I, I want to try it. I'm we're gonna try we're gonna do a video, a short video on how to can your venison. Awesome. And uh, it's, I mean, if you if you say, hey, I can't eat venison because it's too gamey, you have canned venison, you can't tell the difference. That's awesome. It's amazing. It's good stuff, and and in today's day and age with uh, coronavirus and et cetera, I mean, it's cold storage or you know not cold storage. You can store it in closets and out of daylight and you know no refrigeration required yeah Yeah. shelf stable which is nice yeah it's really nice but uh yeah cool all right so uh with that we we move into our show and today we're going to talk about crp seed plans seed plans and how do you go about that and so uh we have with us as i said before a special guest uh kevin anderson kevin anderson's a wildlife biologist and has tons of experience in fact i mean just before we got on camera i mean we sat here and talked for probably a good hour just on all kinds of things we could keep kevin here for probably a week <laughs> <laughs> so really excited to see you and have you here kevin um but before we get started hey what have you been up to I uh, just finished out the late muzzleloader season. I was very fortunate to uh, have both of my sons, uh, 22 and, and 25 year old, come back and spend some Christmas with me and, and the New Year's. And uh, they, um, 
they are deer hunters and, and they, are, they are deer harvesters. They don't mess around. When they set their sights on putting meat in the freezer, you know, college boys, they're, they get it done. Um, I think my youngest went out twice and, and harvested a nice big, I would say a three and a half year old doe, big fat sassy doe. And my oldest sat with me two nights and settled on a, a, a nice 10 point, I'm guessing it was a three and a half year old. He's currently looking for um, his first job. He just finished up his master's degree in cancer research. So he's living with me until he gets a job. And he said, dad, I don't know when the jobs are coming. So I'm going to shoot that deer. And they were done. And then luckily they got to hang out with the old man and watch him harvest some does and I was in doe mode because I harvested a, a nice buck during the bow season. Uh, after my, and, and I didn't tell you guys this, but after my 30th set, I finally harvested a, a deer. I, I watched a lot of deer and I finally said, okay, that's the one. And, and you know, you do your work and you, I don't know whether you get lucky or you just, you know, just happens. And then uh, harvested a deer, just backing it up, harvested a deer during a doe during the early muzz. I had never done it. And I said, I've never done it and I want to try it. And it was amazing to me because you see them in a whole different light, not broken up, not fighting, um, pre-rut. Uh, I absolutely loved it. I might try it again, maybe next year, this year. Uh, so I harvested a doe at the last second of the last second of the season. And, and cause I was waiting, you always wait for that, maybe that big boy. And so I, um, I was real lucky. I had two deer in the freezer by the end of November. And then I went into uh, late muzzleloader with bow tags left, doe specific and, I got it done on the next to the last night. So, it was, Kevin, we've got a uh, European mount uh, podcast coming out this week, probably. Oh, so cool. you'll have to share that with your son, or maybe even yourself, with that uh, I that will. buck, and uh, I will give it a shot. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a great fall. I'm busy, um, you know, always busy with uh, with work, and I, I love it. Um, a lot of field visits still. Um, the snow has kind of slowed it down a little, but I think this will lead right into what we're going to talk about. We have a new CRP sign up going right now, a new general CRP sign up from start of January 4th. So we're about a week in and it goes till February 12th. So it's kind of short. So if the folks are interested, anybody interested, um, it's kind of a different world. Um, probably can't get into a USDA service center, but you'll have to call ahead and see what their kind of guidelines and rules are in their county. But it's still doable. You can still get a hold of FSA, Farm Service Agency. They're the ones that that'll help you through that process. And then eventually you'll be with the Natural Resources Conservation Service folks and the Pheasants Forever folks and the DNR folks. So it's pretty exciting. And those contracts can run what, 10, 10 and 15 years? Is that right, generally? 10, yep, depending on the practice. Um, yes, most of our native grass practices are 10, but there are some 15 year options and we do have tree planting options that can run all the way up to 15 years. So. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, we had one a year ago, and uh, we got a lot of folks back in, and we got some new folks in. And uh, I know uh, I know we're trying to get more folks in this time. So well, and that kind of brings us to our topic. So last year, I, I actually signed up the remainder of my property for CRP, and I end up choosing CP twenty five. CP twenty five. I was going to say CP forty two, but I already have that in. So CP25, which is primarily a grass CRP, which is what I was t wanting anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so before we go into that, Kevin, I, I think I ought to talk about what are my goals, mm -hmm. right? I think that's if it's something that you guys have kind of hammered into Joel and I is, is before you go out and do something, figure out what your goals are, which totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. So... I scripted out my goals, and what I'd like to do is provide a. Ha I wanted to provide a habitat for whitetails, but I also wanted to provide a habitat for upland birds and turkeys. Yep. And then uh, I'd like it to be aesthetically pleasing, and uh, that's important just because it's uh, it's around where we live. So I want to be able to like what I'm looking at every day. Right. And uh, and then. Uh, Lastly, safety is my my fourth goal, and the reason I say safety is is uh, depending on whether it's a ten or a fifteen year contract, um, we have to do a mid contract management plan, and generally that means I mean the one I'm going to choose is burning, so I'll have to burn. For those of you who are not familiar, I'll have to burn 
my fields mm -hmm. uh, to get rid of invasive species, et cetera, and it's good for the grasses as well. Right. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to want to incorporate in fire breaks, and that's something you introduced me to last time we talked. And fire breaks are a super important. I hadn't even thought of it. So right. Uh, so with that, those are my goals. Mm -hmm. So with the CP. 25 plan I know requires uh, five species of grasses right and no less than 10 species of forbs which are flowers right that is correct right yep so so with that I have actually created Kevin uh, so I have a seed plan we'll we'll kind of create and we'll share that. I have a seed plan and then I also have and what I've done Joel what I've done is I've actually gone through and I've gone through all the grasses to find out how tall they get mm -hmm. and then also are they receptive to burning as a way of management Right. Um, and the reason that that's important is, is uh, when I did my CP42 plan, I'm doing a lot of talking, but I'm going to turn it over to you here in a second. No worries. Uh, in my CP42 plan, um, when I went through all the species and what I planted, some of the species aren't receptive to burning, which is how I want to manage it. So um, they're going to be stressed when I go to burn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't want that to be. Right. Um, and the reason I want to be is I don't want to have to replant it because these seeds can be pretty expensive. Right. So that's that. Now I have another piece to where I have created. There you go. I have actually created a plat map of my fields that I have across our property. Mm -hmm. And I have it color coded and I have it color coded in purple and green. The purple being, uh, what I would like to do is target four foot high of grasses and forbs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the green area is six to seven foot or, or better of grasses and forbs. Now that said, um, the reason the four foot is, is it's around my house. Uh, when it comes to burning, I'll be able to manage it a mm -hmm. little better than that six to seven feet is my thinking. Mm -hmm. So, all right. That said, now I'm turning over to you. Okay. <clears throat> um, what do I do next? I mean, A, will doing this, can I do this and hit my goals? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were talking... You guys kind of know me now. We've been together a few times, and you know the, 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 the wheels are spinning when you're talking. I'm mm -hmm. thinking my way through what you're saying to me because that's usually what happens when I go out and meet with a landowner. They're like, I love Bob White Quail, and I've got him to CRP. I've signed up for a CP25. Most folks don't know this. You can choose a short CP25, which is your four foot or under type of grasses, your little blue stem, your side oats grandma, your um, Virginia wild rice, your prairie drop seeds, most of those, and it, this all goes back to, and you know where I'm going with this, it all goes back to your soil types. As we look out the window, I can see uh, a hillside, very, not, not steep slopes, but I, I know that is a different soil type than down on a bottom. We have riparian areas where it'll probably be better soil because some of that soil that used to be up top is now down in the bottoms. True. So when you're talking about planting a short mix, and luckily where you're talking about this, I can see it on your aerial photo, is kind of up on these ridges, up around your residence. So I think automatically I go, gosh, short CP25, because that has those species, those grass and flower species that will be shorter. Your little blue stem will probably be your primary short grass. It's a bunch grass, it's a prairie bunch grass, which means when it forms, it comes up in a bunch. It's not just a single stem like a, a switchgrass, which will be a single stem in multiple places. Uh, a little blue will be a, a bunch grass, and you'll see it when it starts to mature. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Everyone says, I want flowers. But native grasses, when they mature, 
even when they're blooming, they're great. But when they mature in the fall, all those contrasts of kind of purplish, you know, oranges and just, they're beautiful. So when you said short, I didn't mention this to you when we prefaced it before the, before the show, but I thought, oh my gosh, a CP25 short up around here. Um, and I tell people tall and short are relative. And it all goes back to, like I said before, soils. If you're planting a CP25 tall out here, it might be four feet tall just because of the soil types you have. It might be, it may only get that tall. But I found, I've been down here to 21st year. I started my 21st year, January 1st. And it seems like in Southern Iowa where we were primarily, not always, but primarily more wooded, um, woodland acres. And we did have Savannah. I mean, Savannah was present, which just meant it was a mix of scattered oaks and hickories and some prairie. Um, I found, and I was, I struggled with it when I first got down here for the first four or five years because I would see these native seedings take twice as long as northern Iowa, which was prairie soil. I mean, it was absolutely prairie soil. A lot of this isn't. And I, I didn't quite figure it out, and I don't know if I still have, but I think it boils down to the the life in the soil, the biology in the soil. If it didn't grow there before, it probably doesn't have everything it needs to grow now. So it takes a while longer. And after I kind of started figuring this out, I would tell the landowners and customers I worked with, be patient. You know, the three P's of planting and prairie, patience, 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 in year one, two, and three. <laughs> Please be patient, it will come. If we mow and we eventually do our fire, we, we may not get six, seven, eight foot tall grass, but we will get prairie grass. We will get prairie flowers. So going back to that CP25, you do have a choice. You can talk to the folks in the office, FSA and NRCS and say, is it okay if I plant a CP25 short here and a CP25 tall here? Absolutely, because they'll have cost share for that. All you have to do is have an approved seeding plan. Like you talked about the 10 native flowers and the five native grasses. So. If we were doing this plan today, I would say, geez, Tim, I would look at a short up on your ridges, up around the building site, uh -huh. and I would look at a tall everywhere else. Because you've kind of told me before, man, I would really like that to be for deer and upland bird, and they're both good for deer and upland bird. I have guys say, well, I, I signed up for a practice that I have to plant a short mix for bobwhite quail. Is that good for white-tailed deer? Once it matures, once it's, and I, I always ask guys, and we're standing out in the field, and I'm about 5'8", and I'll say, well, up to my waist is about three feet, right? Can I hide a trophy buck in three feet in native grass? I think it's obvious. You can hide deer in shorter. I mean, I've seen them tuck into a little weed patch, and you know, I can't see them. So any type of mix you plant is good. Okay. Any type, short, tall. But I like how you've said, I want to manage this because of my building site. And the other places... I'd like the tall to be there because I know that's that's where I want to do deer and turkey and, and maybe pheasant and quail. I don't, and that's something we can talk about in a little bit about what you have in your area as far as upland game birds. But yeah, it's very doable. Okay, I, I would seriously think about um, entertaining that when you do a tall versus a short. Okay, and Kevin, this might be on or off mm -hmm. topic a little mm -hmm. bit, but um, from a habitat standpoint. You know, are we obviously with grasses and this type of habitat that Tim's looking at planting, you know, it provides cover, mm -hmm. but is the seeds and I mean, is there food supply there too, or is it mostly cover? There is some food value to native flowers, <clears throat> a small amount of native grass, your switchgrass, there will be some bird use of that. We actually, years ago, when one of the first things we planted, when we got out of kind of the brome fescue cool season grass clover mixes into natives back in the, I'd say the late eighties cause CRP started in 85 and got started to get planted in 86. I started seeing folks up in my home County of Carroll County planting this thing called switchgrass. And what is this stuff? You know, oh geez, it's all weedy and stuff. And then after three years, you're like, oh, that's where the wildlife wants to go. And we would, we would pheasant hunt back then. My dad had Brittany's and we enjoyed the heck out of that. Although it was, you know, once it gets six, seven, eight feet tall, you're like, where did the dogs go and where did everybody else go? Yeah. But we would actually clean pheasants with switchgrass seed in the crop. So it, it does have some food value. Some of the lighter, fluffier, like Indian and uh, Big Blue and Little Blue probably don't have as much food value to birds and, and wildlife. But you also have some of your flowers, um, Joel, that 
Uh, I think of partridge pea, an early successional plant, blooms the first year. You're going to have, uh, that's a native legume. Uh, quail will eat it. Some of our songbirds eat, songbirds eat it. Uh, Illinois bundle flower, prairie mimosa, in other words, mm -hmm. another native legume. Uh, got a pretty good uh, uh, seed pot on its seed production. Um, there is some food value to it. it it's, not, it's not the end-all, be-all food value. Um, they're still going to do a lot of insect. And that's what I always tell guys. If, if you're just planting native grasses, that's great. But if you have that diversity, I always think about 12 months out of the year. How, how, do, I, how do I get my birds, or especially birds, um, let's just say pheasant and quail, how do I get them from the nest to the next year? How do I get them to survive? Well, anything that blooms, once you get that prairie established, is going to attract insects. And that is vitally important. If it attracts sense. insects... I'm probably going to have some nesters there, which is awesome. That means, you know, I've got my nesting spot. I've got, I've got my, I've got my dinner plate right by the nesting spot. And hopefully I've got what we call bugging and brooding habitat. And that could be your pollinator. That could be your short CP25. Um, could be your tall CP25 because birds in general will use what's there. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. that was a great question. Yeah. yeah, it really was. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so with that, mm -hmm. uh, as you're sitting there talking about, and I know my ground's highly rotable, mm -hmm. um, is it possible with CRP to heal the ground? Absolutely. That's one thing that I, I'm not sure whether we talked about, I think we did talk about it in our last, the last time you guys had me over. Um, we talked about soil and soil health, and, and that's something, it's, it's kind of buzzwords, uh, cover crops and all these things that are going on. I think people's minds are opening up and we're like, we have a valuable, valuable resource in this state, in the Midwest. I mean, this soil is where everything begins, whether it's planting a prairie, planting a food plot, um, whatever's happening on your land, whether you grow big deer or you have pheasant or whatever wildlife crops, it all begins at that soil. Everything does. Water quality, soil quality, wildlife habitat, it all begins right there. Can you heal the soil? Yes, absolutely. I've, I've actually seen it. I've, I've been out with our soil scientist in the area office, Jason Steele. He's the NRCS area soil scientist. And I always like to say, you're younger than me, but man, I'm learning from you. I'm really, really learning from you. And even cover crops, wheat, rye, uh, you know, uh, oats, triticale, whatever these uh, farmers are doing to start healing their soil, get that microbial action back in it. I won't go into that because I'm not an expert in it at all. But with prairies, I always think about what are we doing? If we're planting a prairie on a timber soil, will that help heal? Yeah, it takes time. It takes time for those roots to, to, to penetrate and get down in there. If you had erosion before, it may take some time. You may have to do some things. I've had landowners have to go back in and rework waterways and, you know, because prairie takes a long time to set its roots down. It's not an annual crop. Um, most of it isn't. So yes, uh, water quality, soil health, um, absolutely. Um, you can actually see it. Uh, one of the things I learned from Jason was take a spade. When you go out and work with these people, take a spade. And he's been out with me. The cool thing is, I'm like, I have some landowners that are doing food plots uh -huh. and lots of food plots. And they would like to know about soil health because, as well, you know, the wildlife gang, we do a lot of food plots. And it can be the same strategy as farmers are using to heal their soils. So he's actually went with me and taken a spade. And he said, this is the most important thing you can bring because you can dig down, see the root structure, see the, the earthworm castings see what's actually going on interesting it's it's very interesting so yes to answer your my long-winded answer is yes you can so you brought up uh cover crops so i put out a last two years ago uh, i did not get crops in because the we had gotten so much rain i just couldn't get in we couldn't get in the field so yeah. uh, i worked with the nrcs office and they helped me get a cover crop just mainly to control the weeds, the erosion, et cetera, on the property. Yep. And uh, we obviously tilled it all under. Um, the next year, which was last year, I did have prescription rain, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the farmer who I was working with, um, who owned this property for 13 years prior, we set a record on, now it's only one data sample, so 
you know, one data doesn't set a trend line, but uh, last year we set a record for the crop for yield on this property. Right. And I think it had to do with, hey, prescription rain, but also that cover crop. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I'm i fascinated by it. Um, you guys know from the last time and the times we've been together out in the field, I'm a, I don't know, I'm addicted to food plots, I guess. I, I like, wa I'm an old farm boy. I like watching things grow. I, I like putting it in the ground, watching it grow. and. And whether I harvest anything off of it or not, I, I like to see the wildlife use it. I can sit with my binoculars in a blind and just watch wildlife. I think yeah, the older we get, the more we yeah. enjoy that, the fruits of that. I, I think it's the most rewarding thing from a land ownership standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we talked about this seed plan. Mm -hmm. So um, then our CS office gave me recommended varieties. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think in this list, I have 11 different varieties of grass, and I think it's, uh, without putting my glasses on, it looks like 30, 30 different varieties of Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, is that all I can use, or can I go and say, like we talked about Indian grass. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say Indian grass wasn't on here. Mm -hmm. Could I say, hey, I want to augment Indian grass into my mix and go to them and say, hey, I'd like to plant Indian grass. Would they be open to that or no? Yeah, yeah, you can You can always, what, what generally happens in the NRCS field offices is they'll have a sample, CP1, CP2, different CRP practices, whether it's cool season, a CP2 is just three native grasses and two legumes. Um, a CP25, we've talked about it just to reiterate, Five native grasses, ten flowers. A pollinator is you need to meet uh, uh, a one to three, one grass to three flower spec. You know, so that can be a lot of different things. You showed me your seeding plan on your pollinator. So if you say, "Gosh, I really like Indian grass and, and I like Canada Wild Dry and Big Blue Stem," they'll have a, a just a generic seeding plan that's been approved. They or the seed dealer will run every seeding plan mix through a, what's known as a seed calculator. And it calculates out that 40 seeds per square foot. I mean, all these numbers are just, they're just drilled in here because I deal with it every day. And I always, I always think this is not a square foot, but this is pretty close to a square foot. And you think, okay, that's going to have 40 seeds scattered about when someone broadcasts or drills or however they put the seed on or in the ground. So as long as, if you say, I'd like to add that, could you add that? As long as you're you know, you don't change it 14 times and, and they start going, geez, Tim, what do you really want? They'll have a, they'll just have a generic plan that says, here's a good mix. This meets, this meets all the specs and standards of your CRP practice. But if you say, boy, can we add Indian in there? And, and maybe I, maybe I don't like another native grass that's in there. Sure, you can do that with, with some judiciousness, I would say. Yeah, yeah. with some approval. Y yes, absolutely. Okay. I've had a lot of landowners say, can I add more? I really love uh, butterfly milkweed, I love it. Can I add that into the mix? Sure, as long as you're upfront with them and get it done before any seed is purchased or any of that stuff, yeah. And Perfect. usually it's working with either a soil con, a district conservationist, um, like Shane Weidenberg with Pheasants Forever. I know he works out of the Albia and some of the other field offices. Just visit with them. It's always good to be upfront and honest and just say, can we, I don't wanna change it 20 times, but I'd like, to, I'd like to add this in there, or I'd like to add another flower. That mix right there is above and beyond their seeding standards. Okay. It's absolutely above and beyond it, which okay. is not bad. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, all right. All right, uh, Joel, you have any questions? I've, Not at this time. I've got a, I've got a plethora. <laughs> uh, so, all right, so let's go back to my goals with uh, creating habitat. Mm -hmm. um, how long does it take for upland birds to come back? I mean, I, I would say, hey, around this, around my immediate area, we might have a pheasant or two, but they're, they're not in abundance. Right. So... Um, I'll leave it at that. How, how long does that take? Well, and I've been dealing with this for years, and it's a good thing to deal with. It really is, because 
I'll talk to landowners on the phone in my office on my cell driving down the road and they'll say, hey, I've got an 80, I've got a 60, I've got a 40. Well, where are you at? Well, I'm in Monroe or I'm in Jefferson or I'm in Scott County. Uh, and the hardest thing for me when I talk to landowners and not, we're not out on the land riding around, walking around is, and I love it that we have these, these props here, you know, just, I look at this and I see a lot of woodland. So that tells me we're in deer and turkey habitat. We all know we're in deer and turkey habitat. Pheasants are an introduced species. They were introduced years and years and years ago into Iowa, accidentally, on purpose. Um, and we have pheasants in Monroe County. We have pheasants in Appanoose. We have pheasants in these southern two tiers, but this is historic quail habitat. It always has been and always will be if we manage it that way. And I always tell guys and gals, look around, and, and I used to do this a lot and I still do it quite a bit, I used to bring a kind of a one to two mile aerial photo. And we have really great aerial photos now that you can see a lot. And then I'd blow it out to five miles because you can be managing for pheasant and quail on your farm. And if it's all pasture and timber and everything around it, you are a, you're kind of a, a sink. You're kind of like, oh, there's the last bastion of hope. If any pheasants and quail are there, they might be living on your farm. Maybe that's where they come to. If you don't have any neighbors with any habitat, it could be very shy. Can I pull pheasant and quail here? Absolutely, but it might take a while. Um, I learned this a long time ago. There has to be, and I call it connective tissue, to get from however far out a pheasant, you know, a covey of quail or some pheasants are to get to your farm. Uh, I wouldn't say that's woodland for pheasant and quail. I would say that's more brushy fence rows and Maybe there's spots where you have native grasses and CRP around you, maybe even out a mile. They will come, but it just depends on what's in your neighborhood. It's all dependent on habitat. I don't guarantee, I just don't because I don't, I don't know. You know, it's going to take a while to establish, two, three, four years. Once it's established, if you're doing the right things, you're gonna do the right thing with burning. You're gonna do the right thing with managing it. You're gonna have food plots. You might have a covey and quail in year one. They may be nearby, don't know. One yeah. thing to do is in the mornings, in the spring, when you're maybe out turkey hunting, listen for the, listen for the bobs. Yeah, I don't hear them. I wish so, I did, I wish I did. So that doesn't mean they're not here. They could be here. I bet you've got quail around, they, for they, sure. They could be here. And sometime in the fall, we should do a, in October, and I know we're all wanting to be in a, in a tree or do something, but you can do fall covey counts where they wake up in the morning and they they um, they talk to each other. The covey talks to each other, and it's really cool. And I've went out with really? lots of my oh, it's wonderful. Just when when we're off, just go to your phone and pull up covey covey call counts. And it's it's <laughs> yeah, you know, what a wildlife biologist doing their spare I'm time. I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, Kevin's out with his coffee, like there's a quail. There's a quail. <laughs> there's right? a covey. Yeah, yeah. All biologists are crazy. I know. But no, um, it, that's a great question. And I get that question more than you'd ever imagine. I, I'm planning CRP. I'm in this neighborhood. Will the birds come? You know, the old saying, build it and they will come. But it depends on what's in your area. Is there other habitat? Is there other connective tissue to get those birds to you? So that leads me to, I have a good friend who... Uh, Oh, raises raising would be a um, a strong word, but um, but we'll use it for for context. Mm -hmm. Raises pheasant and quail, mm -hmm. and introduces them into his property, and he's got a fairly sizable farm. Mm -hmm. uh, would that is that a good thing to do? Um, I'm glad you brought that up. And you know, they always say if you had a nickel for every time people have asked you that. It started when I moved down here in 2000, um, had guys and gals saying, you know, we used to have pheasant and quail here and we don't have them anymore. And my question always is, what's changed on the farm? Well, nothing. And I always equate it to if uh, your wife was to move the couch, you know, 12 inches over here or a foot over there, in two or three months, you didn't even know it sat there at one time. Or if you moved that table over here, mm -hmm. three or four months later, you forget. Well, hedgerows have been dozed out on the farm and ditches have been filled in. And no offense to anybody improving their farm. It happens. You know, maybe you were in CRP for 20 years and you said, my son wants to farm it. So that can happen. So getting back to the original question, when people ask me that, I always ask them, the first question is, do you have habitat for birds? 
do you have habitat on the farm for, for native birds, wild birds that could be in the area? If, if, you, if you don't, then introducing birds there with no habitat is like trying to live outside in the wintertime. If there's no roof over your head, they're probably not going to make it. And they cost money. You know, um, pen raised birds cost money. So my next question would be if they say, well, if I, if, if I stock quail or pheasant on my farm, will they propagate? And I'll let your viewers and listeners do their research. And I, I've done a lot of it. I've, you know, gone in and looked at these um, uh, folks that make the brooders, you know, the self-contained things. And I won't name any names, but um, some of the states around us have done studies on those. And um, it's a very small percentage of the birds that actually... Um, will make it and I always equate it back to we had parents that helped raise us you know and they taught us right from wrong and wildlife whether they live a year or whether they live five years they have some sort of I'd call it wildlife parental guidance you know the, sure. the, the warning call when a hawk is overhead and when, when you're introducing um, young pheasant or quail with no parental guidance um, it, it can be pretty devastating you, yeah, you can get pred analogy. predation pretty quickly I've actually seen it. I've, I, I won't tell you all the stories, but I've been out with landowners that have opened up their brooder and they've lost a bunch or they've come up and found feathers everywhere after they've let them go. So the last question I get, and this is how I'll finish it, folks will say, well, I wonder if I have some okay habitat and I've got a young bird dog and I've got some kids that really want to shoot some birds. Is it okay to go buy some adult pheasant, adult quail and release them on my farm and just work the bird dog, have a buddy come over and we, we shoot some of these birds. Absolutely. Um, but then, you know, the biologist in me always kicks in and goes, be careful what you're introducing. If you have wild birds, um, make sure they're d disease free because wild birds can carry a number of diseases and pen raised birds can carry a number of diseases. So be careful what you bring in onto that farm. Smart. It is. And I, I guess I always think back to that same saying, build it and they will come. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But um, I personally, after everything I've read and after all my, my anecdotal visual things that I see when I'm in the field with the guys that do use that system, um, I think it's okay. But I, I, me personally, I'd rather spend money on the habitat. And if they're in the neighborhood, I want to invite them over when the habitat is right. Yeah, so, parental. Kevin, if I was if I was going to put you on a spot, sure. you know, in ten, it's two years from now or three years from now, and the the CR twenty five is uh, you know growing full growth or whatever, yep. and Tim planted a hundred birds, yep. what would be the you know, what would be your best guess on survival? Less than ten percent. Less than ten. Yeah, I've I've seen a lot of studies done. I don't believe in Iowa, but some states surrounding us. I won't name them, but I've seen a lot of studies done that go as low as one percent survival. And then I've seen other studies that say less than one percent of that, if those birds do survive till spring, less than one percent of the nest will be successful. So I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but to me, if I can do habitat work and hopefully pull birds in if they're in the neighborhood, sometimes you're not in pheasant and quail habitat. Sometimes you're just not. We're more likely to be in quail habitat. Not You might have, like you said, you may have seen, heard pheasant. Mm -hmm. If you have any pheasants in the neighborhood and you do this, and, and I know you're gonna do it right, you're going to probably have some pheasants here. But I've got a friend in Jefferson County. I've known him for 21 years now and I met him in 2001 and he basically said, I'm going from Brome and I want you to tell me what to do because I went to school at Iowa State and we had pheasants up there. Well, it's Prairie Pajo region. Right. We had pheasants up there. <laughs> we all know that. And he's like, I want pheasants on this farm. And I was a noob literally when I came down quail. Uh, so I went and got with some DNR biologists that have been down here for decades and said, I need to know how to manage them. And they're like, we're still learning. So if you have quail habitat, manage it the best you can. Edge feather, you know, plant shrubs, uh, plant short native grasses and flowers, have some disturbance, have some disking, fire. If you do quail work, you'll have pheasants. If you do pheasant work and just pheasant work, you may not have a lot of quail because we tend to plant tall things and, you know, tall native species. Sure. So, um, yeah, I say manage the ground you have, do the best you can. Um, if you want to stock birds, stock birds. But I would rather put it in habitat. So I've got to ask then, 
Uh, we've asked this before, but you said we're we're in, we're a turkey country right here, yeah. right? Because we got the woodlands, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have to worry about the turkeys disrupting uh, my pheasant nests or my quail nests, poking their eggs, etc.? No. <laughs> I no. like the short answer, Kevin. I really no. like the short answer. <laughs> One more, no. No, um, I, I would worry more about your habitat. I've looked at spectacular quail habitat potential where you go, man, we can edge feather the edge of the woods. Even if you put in a 30 to 120 foot quail buffer down along the woodland and you've got crop on the outside of it, we've just improved it 100% because we gave them brushy habitat to survive the winter, to cool off in the summer with shade. We gave them nesting, bugging, brooding habitat, and there's food on the outside. So, yeah, I, I just say no because turkey and quail evolved with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard it countless times, uh, so many times that, man, you know, our, our turkey population is impacting our quail population. And there's really no good evidence that proves that to be true. Okay. So I, I don't worry about it. And I see our turkey numbers kind of struggling in places. And I think, uh, boy, if our turkeys go away, will our, will our quail come back? And guys are always like, what? You know? <laughs> so it's kind of a, I don't know whether you would call it a rural legend, but it's out there. It is out there. I had never so, heard about know. it until a couple of years ago. And I'm like, what? Was it when you moved down here? Yeah. About, yeah, yeah, me, yeah. Me too. Yeah. I mean, literally when I, I moved down from far northern Iowa, <laughs> first time I heard it, I went, Oh, they're pulling a fast one on me, right? This is some sort of... Oh, some... they really believe it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's passion around it. There's no doubt about it. Sure, so. sure. Okay. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be be safe, safe, have have fun, fun, and and get get outdoors. outdoors.